dark and chewing hole in the bow. Will the ocean to enter allow? Oh, but more a sin than letting it in. It's letting our good fortune out. The nest of the storm did succumb while the crow hid his fear in the rum. And the mast it broke and threw out the boat and will now be surely my chum. Cause the ship's Greetings everyone, I'm Captain Spifari, and I've been waiting since the beginning to do this one. There are lots of bad animated films out there, but this movie? This is the classic unintentional comedy. It has many genuinely good things going for it. It has great animation, great visuals, and most of all, great voice acting. But, in terms of plot, and especially characterization, it fails fabulously. I present to you, The Princess and the Pea. So, what is The Princess and the Pea? Well, technically, it's a super short fairy tale by Hans Christian Andersen, but that's not important right now. The Princess and the Pea is a 2002 animated film released by Feature Films for Families. Which is exactly what you think it would be. A family film company releasing family-oriented movies with family values by which they mean toddler-friendly films. Yeah, focus on the family- I mean feature films for families is pretty much the four kids entertainment of non-English Western animation in that most of their animated output are English dubs of films by Pannonia Film Studio. I mentioned them quite a few times before as they made The Seventh Brother, Willy the Sparrow, Vuk the Little Fox, and of course I've already looked at their British-Hungarian co-production, The Princess and the Goblin, on the second Smooth Sailing episode. In fact, coincidentally, this film, which is technically an American film, was also animated by Pannonia Film Studio. But unlike The Princess and the Goblin, The Princess and the Pea is not a treasure of smooth sailing, but it is a treasure of unintentionally hilarious stupidity. The Princess and the Pea is basically about a princess with psychic powers to sense light objects underneath a huge stock of mattresses, and that apparently makes her a real princess to some prince who desperately wants a wife but can't find a suitable one. It's supposed to be a tale about how either real women are weak, or that real princesses are so sensitive that they're sensitive to objects well below them, but it sounds more like the prince wanted a telekinetic to be his queen. Guess that would help make an efficient ruler. Anyways, that sounds like it would, what, fit into a five panel comic strip? So what poppy fuck did it take to inflate this story like bad DeviantArt fetish art into an hour long? By filling it with Disney and Don Bluth cliches, of course. I mean, fuck. Feature Films for Families is so determined to rip off Disney that they stole their fucking FBI warning screen and just changed it slightly. Besides the over-censored English dubs of non-English Western animated films, Quadruple F is also known for releasing The Buttercream Gang, a notoriously cheesy 90s family film with a title that either sounds like a hard core gay porno, or a white ripoff of the Sugar Hill Gang. And on the DVD of that movie, they just flat out steal Disney's green FBI warning screens without changing them. I guess they didn't want the Disney inspiration to be as obvious with the princess and the pea, so they changed the warning screens slightly. Oh well, let's start the movie already. Now, the last chapter will close on Wyndham's reign. And a new one 
<laughs> oh, that's very cute. Someone watched The Secret of Nim and wanted to make their very own. Well, I do too. That's why I'm going to write a Secret of Nim and Peter No Tail crossover. Anyways, this combined ripoff of Nicodemus and Jeremy is Sebastian, but he's a raven, not a crow or a rat, and his ink isn't glowing, so it's different. Anyways, a wise mage in a comic relief's body tells us a little exposition. Oh, to have lived in the golden days of the Kingdom of the Heart. What the fuck? That's this country's name? The Kingdom of the Heart? That's fucking stupid! I know, let's call the United States of America the Republic of Democracy, because that would be imperialist of us to call ourselves America when there's more countries in the continents of America, like Canada, Brazil, and Mexico. I mean, the Arab world doesn't have United Arab Emirates or Saudi Arabia, and Australia doesn't have Australia! Nowadays, people want to call that last continent Oceania, but you know, both names work. Australia spies on its citizens and can throw you in prison for 10 years over selling obscene films, and they're also colonizers towards their surrounding countries too. Just ask Witness K, who exposed how we helped an oil company fuck over Timor-Leste. We're pushing to try him in a secret court. So they might as well be the whole continent, but they're also like Oceania from Orwell's 1984 because of this. But wow, this country is just hot. That's the lamest name for a kingdom ever. And it doesn't even have the politeness excuse. Anyways, my political tangent is relevant because just like in America, the people have become greedy and prideful and evil. Dude, that's probably just a vocal minority who have overshadowed the majority. They probably thought the king was a fascist, I mean, imperialist emperor, because fascism and communism didn't exist back then. And how'd you get that, eh? By exploiting the workers by hanging on to outdated imperialist dogma which perpetuates the economic and social differences in our society. And no, Monty Python doesn't count, but empires did, and empires are evil. So basically, the original fairy tale is ancient history, and some information was lost even though the story is known by legend at this point, so what? But anyways, Sebastian is worried because even though good King Wunham is in charge, his son, the evil Prince Laird, is going to be made king. <laughs> Laird? Okay, that's far from the worst name I've ever heard, but that's still a pretty silly name. Oh well, who is this evil Prince Laird? Listen to them, Helsa. Dragons of society singing, dancing. Tomorrow I will rule the kingdom. Then we'll see what they have to sing and dance about. I should have dressed in my steampunk finest for this review. Holy shit, Voltaire's the villain of this movie! Voltaire the singer, not Voltaire the philosopher. Ah, uh, Aurelio Voltaire's the villain of this movie! This movie just took 80 levels up. Look at that villain. He's obviously evil, but he's fabulous, bitch! The fan girls and gay guys are gonna be all over him with that accent and beard. Actually, this is Laird, and he's not voiced by Voltaire, the goth musician. He is voiced by someone else, but still, he does a great job. And seriously, I did not make this joke for nothing. Laird looks almost exactly like Voltaire in the early 2000s. The only things he's missing are the manly earrings and the mustache, and possibly some cool shades. Listen to them, Helsa. Dragons of society singing, dancing. How disgusting. You're so right, Laird. Oh, come on, Voltaire. We all know you sing. And since this is a musical, I think we all know what song he's going to be singing. Down in Carolina, I met a girl with an eyes. So I reached down between us, and I whipped out my... 
Oh, what you expected when you're evil? That's Voltaire's signature song. It's so cliched and too obvious. Besides, this is feature films for families. It would only use a song that specifically omitted those awful profane words. But anyways, while Laird and his wife Helsa are being obviously evil, the kid's sidekick, Prince Rollo, is introduced. It is rumored that the crown prince, young Rolo, from the faraway kingdom of Avea. Oh look, his country has an actual name. So how does this convoluted crap about a kingdom without a real name have to do with a psychic princess having insomnia over said powers? <laughs> Oh, so this kingdom does have a name, and it's the Spanish word for hot, but with an I in between the Z and the O? Well, if they don't speak Spanish, I guess it's a real name. Anyways, these people sure are happy for a country that went through chaos. I guess it's Corazian's equivalent of the 50s. They just had a peace, and now they're scared of the communists, I mean Republicans, who want to abolish the monarchy, so they feign happiness. So Prince Rolo is friends with our hero Heath, Laird's good younger brother, and they visit Sebastian. Rolo found a tapestry about the Old Kingdom and the whole Princess and the Pea legend. You mean my treasure map is all about girls? No, marrying girls. Yeah. Just like Kid Derek from The Swan Princess, once again one of the few Disney-esque animated films that has that whole foxtrot type girls are icky mentality in juvenile male characters. At least he grows out of it far more gracefully than Derek. What else is there? It says here that if the key to the pea is lost, the kingdom will end during the reign of the... 18th King. Oh no, the commu- I mean, Republican Democrats will take over. But that will be Laird. And you know what that line and scene transition mean? Time for a fabulous villain song! There's just one way to get your subjects to respect you. When they say they want a steak, you give them gruel. Though I know my manner seems a trifle shrill, still, that's what it takes to rule, my pet. That's what it takes to rule. See, I told you that Laird sings in this movie. Oh, and much like Count Grisham from The Scarecrow, he has a bird who helps him. Come to think of it, aside from Laird, Grisham is another character who would be fitting for Voltaire to voice, especially since Grisham has that somewhat totes radical hip personality that I do think Voltaire himself would have fun with. But even though Voltaire himself doesn't voice any of them, Laird's voice actor is clearly having fun. Got to have a flair for all the latest fashion. You must devour each silver cape and silken vest. Oh, poppy fuck. Silver? Really? Pfft, come on. Look at you. You're all in black. We all know that you're goth, Laird. Laird is actually voiced by Ronan Vibert, a British actor who just passed away a year ago. Shit, that sucks ass. He's appeared in many films and television programs, but The Princess and the Pea is the only animated work he was in. At least he succeeded where Anthony Newley failed. That is, being in an animation, and he chose every scene he's in. The Princess and the Pea is not a good film by any means, so this being the only animated work one was in would be shameful, but holy shit does he sell this role. Laird may not be a well-written villain at all, but he is anything but disappointing. This song goes from merely, and yes, I am saying merely because this isn't even the tip of the frozen piss iceberg that is this movie. An energetic but all-in-all -all generic villain song about how our villain is super evil to unintentionally comedic when Rollo starts childishly calling out Laird and Laird starts getting ridiculously offended 
splendid. What's it all worth when there are families cold and hungry? Oh, my bleeding-hearted friend, you are a fool. No, 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 you can't portray bleeding hearts in a sympathetic light. Don't you know bleeding hearts are devil-worshipping liberal commies? See what I mean? The villain dishes out villain talk, but he gets offended when people call him out. Shouldn't he be happy to be called evil? When I'm crowned, I'll have you hung, drawn, and quartered, and I'll squash your measly kingdom like a bug. Is he threatening Rolo or Heath? Either way, I'm pretty sure you can't just do that to a various crown prince. I think that's outside your jurisdiction. And then they get into a food fight. If it wasn't for that stupid old rule that the oldest is crowned king. Actually, the law of the father states that the first son to enter the coronation room shall be crowned king. Oh, uh, okay, problem solved. I don't know why that wasn't established earlier. And conveniently enough, Laird is in his room because he can't find his shoes. But you have lots of shoes. Obviously, you've never read Dressed for Succession. So basically, Laird, in addition to being a goth villain who looks like Voltaire, is also a fashion-obsessed sissy villain like Count Grisham and is obsessed with shoes. Why doesn't he have earrings? We all know piercings on men equals cool. And this is where it becomes clear that no, the writing's not going to improve. Basically, since Laird demands Heath get his shoes so that Laird can look good, when really, Laird's already fabulous, Heath uses this as an opportunity to seize the throne peacefully, but he's reluctant. Heath ends up walking into the coronation room, where Laird left his shoes first. It's all in accordance to the laws. The first son to enter shall be king. And thus, because of Laird being an effeminate Gaston, Heath is crowned king. Ladies and gentlemen, our villain. But Heath decides to be nice. Laird, you are my brother. And I love you. And... What I do for you is in your best interest. I assign you rule over the pig kingdom. Is there a pig kingdom? Is this like Watership Down where each species has its own politics? Does Voltaire know the swine language? Do humans have the power to appoint human kings to rule over a species? So Laird doesn't like this and vows revenge. You could learn swine and then get the pigs on your side by offering them revolution. I mean, pigs are pretty unlucky. They're considered unclean to not even being wanted as pets by Jews and Muslims, and those okay with pigs almost always raise them to be eaten, with some exceptions here and there. Say, you like hammy, over-the-top villains but wish they were stupider? We got you covered. Yes, all of you! I will have revenge. Bow! These golden shoes will never leave my feet until I have regained that which is rightfully mine. Heath expresses concern about his goth brother to his wife, who reveals she's pregnant without directly saying it. She's gonna die, it's obvious. All Disney parents at least have one die, and this is ripping off Disney and Don Bluth, so yeah. Voltaire also has a baby who doesn't end up killing her mother. Being good sucks, doesn't it? Nine months I've sweated and grunted and groveled in the mud with the pig farmers and their beasts. So apparently, I am Goth is king over the pig farmers. So this kingdom is already communist because the means of production are controlled. He's close to giving up on revenge and even takes off his shoes. <gasps> Lad, you broke your promise! But he hears about Heath's wife's predictable death and gets an idea. They fake their own daughter's death and replace Heath's daughter with her own, while Goth Ston's wife Helsa decides to be a surrogate mom. Said daughter of Heath is being examined by Sebastian, who identifies a heart birthmark. Helsa arrives and... Oh, 
Just make sure I get four square meals a day. Plus snacks. Yeah, because fat people eat a lot. So fat. Wait, she's not even fat. She's just chubby. In fact, not only does Laird look attractive, despite them trying to give him a Jafar nose, but Hilsa also looks rather attractive. Look at the way she removes her gloves. I wouldn't be surprised if she worked as a stripper. Uh, funny story. When I showed my friend this film, he jokingly asked if there was rule 34 of this film. Considering the villain is basically designed to be ridiculously attractive in the same vein as Tim Curry and Johnny Depp, I wouldn't be surprised if there was hardcore rule 34 of the characters in this film fucking like bears. So much for family values by feature films for families. But then again, considering that Quiverful is an aspect of some of those family values, it's also not that surprising. <laughs> Unfortunately, I tried looking up fan art of this movie on DeviantArt, but all I got was a bunch of princess fan art, some of which was related to this movie, and when I typed in Lad's name, I got a bunch of Loud House fan art! <laughs> So Hilsa and Laird switch the babies at night, but Hilsa's surprisingly compassionate and seems to care about the princess. Oh, you like your Auntie Hilsa, don't you? Oh, poor little thing. I lost my mother when I was young. So she's reluctant, and even when she does go through, she wants her to stay safe. Said princess turned commoner is named Doria by her new parents, and they're just as obviously evil, but not as fucktastically attractive as the main villains. They also have to check their joints like they're robots. <laughs> Doria then sings a generic I want song about hope and shit because we gotta copy that Disney formula. She sure does love the pigs that her abusive step-parents are forcing her to feed. Meanwhile, Heath's not daughter is raised to be a spoiled brat by Helsa, and yeah, I don't see how they got away with this. The real girl's eyes are green, while the imposters are lavender. That hot birthmark Sebastian identified on the real girl was conveniently painted on the imposter's foot, as we'll see later. Makes sense. But seriously, Seriously, how did Sebastian not get the eye color? Anyways, the princess's actual name that Hilsa and Laird's daughter now has is Hildegard, and Heath is constantly raising her to be like her not-mother. Yet Hildegard doesn't know Hilsa's actually her mother. Is this clash of parental figures gonna lead up to any payoff? So Doria's in a Sleeping Beauty type situation, on um... Wait, Doria still has that blanket her mother made for her, meaning that when she was taken, it also disappeared from the palace? How did Heath or no one else in the palace catch that? Conveniently that same night, Sebastian sneaks into Hildegard's room to perform the place up here under several mattresses test, but then Laird's unnamed bird chases him out. Why is Sebastian just now testing that out? Did the falcon chase him out before, or is he just now realizing something is wrong with a girl who looks more like Laird and Helsa than her own supposed parents? On the other hand, how did he even find out how to perform that test when the info was lost earlier? Well, it turns out the next morning he tells Heath just that for no reason at all, other than exposition that he found that torn info. He then sings a song about it while doing some random yet generic science-y stuff. There's got to be a meaning to the mystery, to the riddle, there has got to be a clue. How on earth can it be that a pea such as he can perform the kind of magic that you do? It's not the pea, it's the princess. A real one has psychic powers. Well, there goes the furry's Saturday nights for the next month or two. Sebastian tests, uh, something at the end of the song. Rolo, now grown up, shows up in disguise and spars with Heath while talking about the kingdom's turmoil. You both seem very happy in your kingdom. Oh yeah? I've been distracted with... 
domestic troubles. I think said domestic troubles are actually the direct cause of the unhappiness. I think people are going to be frustrated at best when their fear of a potential tyrant ruling resurfaces. Like in the US, where our civil liberties are constantly being threatened by mass surveillance bills, reactionary censorship, and horrifying tough on crime policies. Sebastian's been telling me about the birds and the peas. We can't have the birds and the bees because this is feature films for families! So Rollo got older, but Heath didn't? Yeah, that makes sense. Anyways, Rollo tells Heath that he needs to marry a princess in a strategically located kingdom that's rich, but he wants a nice princess. Anyways, Rollo seems to like how Hildegard looks in the painting, and Sebastian doesn't tell him or Heath what he found out. Anyways, Hildegard is equally excited about the potential marriage. You there! I've decided to have you! To have me? Hildegard, that's not how it works! Wow, even Helsa knows this is stupid. I, I have to wash my sword. Oh, yes, this feature film for families did just make a phallic weapon joke, and possibly a masturbation joke. Meanwhile, Doria is in public, and two of her pet pigs are... Falling in love, I'm falling in love again. Princess Hungry Star. Their names are Princess and Hungry? Okay, I guess Princess is a fairly common pet name, but Hungry? <sighs> oh my goodness. Junior Jolly. I, I've heard so many stupid names. Why? Who comes up with these kinds of names? Wait, Doria was being raised just nearby? She's in the same town as the royal castle? You'd think Laird would have sent her father away. Speaking of Voltaire, he shows up back to meet his daughter for the first time, and is happy when she insults him. You realize she's probably going to oppress you too, right? Laird also looks as young as he did. Well, I mean, to be fair, as of this review, Voltaire's close to pushing 60, and he still looks like he's in his late 30s. The princess also meets the princess! Laird calls for Rollo and manipulates him. Poor girl. She's had a hard life. Always having to measure up to her mother's memory. Um, yeah, that's kind of rough, but she doesn't seem to care that much beyond annoyance. You just pointed out something that you could have done better. It's amazing when characters know more than the movie itself does. Laird does lie and say she's really good on the inside, but still, she was being compared to her mother constantly, and also had a second parental figure trying to teach her to be evil. Rollo goes into the woods and comes across a Rollo thinks someone's in danger of being attacked by the bear, but the someone is actually Daria. Uh, why is she here? Why is she suddenly friends with all kinds of animals? Remember, Balthazar? <laughs> You're still the only bear in my life. The bear's named after the Babylonian king in the Bible who Daniel told was gonna die at the Medo-Persian Empire's hands? Okay. Rollo and Doria meet each other, a la Sleeping Beauty, to the point of Rollo hiding that he's a prince. Well, this is some place you've got here. Nice, how the hell did you find it and how did you suddenly move here? You were just in public with your evil step-parents. It's my place. My secret place. Oh, it's a retreat. How did you manage to sneak away? So Doria takes Rollo to this giant Sonic the Hedgehog-esque ruined palace she found, and then some creepy CGI demons come out. Every family blessed with food. <laughs> what? How did her step-parents find this place? 
Rolo can't marry her because she's a peasant, now at least. Rolo gets intercepted by Sebastian, who brings Rolo to some other princesses for him to marry. We extend a hearty greeting, for our hearts are in a whirl, at the prospect of your meeting, our precious baby girl. You've tried to raise her right, hoping someday someone might, see a pleasing little reason for our nations to unite. Look, there she goes, the girl is so peculiar, I wonder if she's really well. When picking teams, I never choose her, you'd think she'd take a hint and learn to read. This movie loves taking some inspiration, and not just from Disney films, but I also noticed this film shares its specific inspirations with the Swan Princess, like these ultra-eccentric princesses. Said princesses are kinda dicks and bitch about stupid things, but this is probably the one other thing besides psychic princesses that this movie also has in common with a fairy tale. Notice that I haven't been bringing it up at all. And while Rollo goes princess searching, Sebastian does the pea psychic test with each one of them, and said princesses don't have insomnia. Wow, that test is pointless. Looks like that theory's been disproven. Rollo's disappointed over the constant brats the princesses turn out to be. Wow, is he the only king in the world who doesn't spoil his daughter and just someone else did? Because if so, this world fucking sucks. We need republics. Rolo whines about this to Sebastian, who's still obsessed with a pee. Bird brain, you just tested that out with Miss Complainy Pulse, and it didn't work. Peas don't detect princesses. I have a message you must take to Rolo. I'm a scholar. Not a messenger. I don't know who else I can trust. There seems to be a spy in the castle. I'm going to disinherit Hildegard. If Rolo will marry the peasant girl, I will make him my heir and give them my kingdom. Oh yeah, he can just do that. Years after, he finally realizes that Hildegard probably isn't his daughter and is throwing away the one he raised for years. Naturally, the spy, Helsa, decides to have the Falcon intercept Sebastian. I failed, Heath. I failed Rolo. How? Oh yeah, by relying on a provenly false test. Sebastian falls into Doria's CGI door palace, while Rolo decides that Princess is bad. Laird gets the note Sebastian was to send, and burns it, and then rouses up a mob against Doria. Some evil in our midst has brought this upon us. It is a person. Who could he be? Not me. Look over there. She's different. She talks to animals. She's the cause of our suffering. Just like me and Mike from Peter No Tale, although the fascist symbolism is unintentional in this movie's case, still Mons's original Swedish and British voices do share Lerd's fabulously evil baritone. Daria, don't just stand there, run! The mob sets the forest on fire, but then rally to the rescue. Rolling. Awful! I try to stop the Voltaire, of course, is I'm through my teeth. <coughs> uh -oh. Where there's smoke. They pinch back. Sebastian wakes up and realizes that one of the CG abominations was the princess and the pea. And to reveal the heart of true nobility, place the pea twenty mattresses deep. The princess true is love and sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Upon such, she can never sleep. So it's not really a princess test so much as specifically a good princess test. So almost no princesses ever fit. That's it. It's so simple. The truly noble heart is so sensitive to people's needs and their heartaches. Of course! <laughs> it's in the princess, not the... Exactly! The test only works on psychic princesses, but I was saying that the whole time! So Rolo passes out in Laird's arms after saving Sebastian, and then Laird's lying through his teeth again. What did he say, your lordship? Uh, Hildegard. Everyone's so excited about the news. 
What news? Why, that you want to marry Hildegard, of course. So this convinces Heath that Hildegard is good after all, and they just buy this? Does Heath not suspect anything? Does Rolo not suspect anything? <laughs> the plot conveniences in this film. Doria actually survived, and her leech step parents still make demands, but Doria isn't having it now. Doria and Rolo distant duet, and then Rolo gets dragged away by Hildegard. Just by contrived coincidence, Doria is out looking for a place to sleep for some reason. It's starting to rain, so I guess that wouldn't make for some good ASMR. The woman who was with Sebastian at Doria's birth takes her to shelter, but why does she want to sleep? Is she really that tired? She takes Doria to the castle and comes across Sebastian suddenly. Where was this film pulling out crap at the last minute? It would make more sense if Laird and Hildegard suddenly both got contrived tragic backstories that had no real foreshadowing to give them sympathy. Do you mind if I lay down? Oh, enough with the dramatic music. Sleeping during a rainy thunderstorm is supposed to be ASMR, damn it, not dramatic! Now, what about the pee? The prophecies? All my work? This is so epic and thrilling! I could fall asleep if it wasn't for the thunder and dramatic music. Actually, I could fall asleep if it wasn't for the dramatic music, really. So the test works on good princesses, and he suddenly sees that birthmark too, so he knows that Doria is the real princess. So conveniently, Laird finds him and ties him up and traps Doria's pig Fearless in a purse, right? Fearless tears through the purse with his legs so that he can run Sebastian to the wedding and object. So the truth is revealed, so of course Laird decides to just threaten to kill Daria. He even has his falcon attempt to kill Rolo, but just ends up injuring Heath. Wow, that was the shortest Disney death in history, and the least sappy. That was so stupid that it felt like a parody. Are you sure this is a Disney imitator and not a Shrek imitator? Anyways, Laird kidnaps Doria through a secret passage that he set traps in earlier. I guess he did that when he switched the babies at birth, but Fearless runs through and triggers all of them through the animalistic opposite of his name. Rolo saves Fearless from becoming Laird's, I mean Helsa's, next bacon meal, but Laird pulls a final trap and Roller's done for. <laughs> What? He, he survived having stone debris fall on him? That's the second Disney death in a row! So they get to the castle roof and fight, and suddenly Sebastian shows up in armor! So Laird and Hildegard fall into the water below and are surrounded by an army. And after his jail time, Laird became a professional singer and recorded an album made up of a waveform printed on scrolls. He had to change his name so people would buy his scroll records, and Helsa also gets arrested. So this is a happy ending where Daria's reunited with her father and marries Roloid. This looks like the beginning of another golden age. Oh, so history repeats, doesn't it? Meaning it's going to continuously get bad again until the monarchy is finally replaced by a republic. And that was the Princess and the Pea. It's definitely in the so bad it's good territory. I mean, the villain looks exactly like Voltaire the singer-songwriter, and the plot has really stupid writing and characters, and the silliness of it is enhanced by the genuinely good voice acting, and animation, and character designs. Well, except for Doria's step-parents and this ugly fuck. The whole princess detecting a pee is based on some ridiculous magic crap that's absurdly specific. 
good princesses are apparently psychic enough to know that something that should have been squished by mattresses being both heavy and also being soft and not dense is 20 mattresses below her. And again, Laird seems like a really fun villain to watch, it's just that he got stuck with some stupid characteristics. I kept wanting Laird to rally the people of the Pig Kingdom into some kind of anti-monarchist revolution, but he just uses the mob to go after a specific girl and doesn't even succeed at that, so he just uses it to fake Daria's death and trick Rolo into marrying Hildegard. Rolo is the only character in the film that's actually well written, and damn it, that dramatic music keeps ruining the ASMR rain. But hey, at least Laird makes a good gothic swing musician, and everybody overacts the shit out of everything, and the Disney and Don Bluth ripping off is so unsubtle that it's laughable, especially because it's just so incompetent at everything but the animation and acting. Oh, and on the DVD cover, on the back, it has good things to talk about, as if this was some religious edutainment thing like Veggie Tales. I didn't learn anything moral or practical from this movie, aside from the fact that peas are apparently like Mentos mixed with coke. Seriously, how are we supposed to learn from these underdeveloped characters? This movie was stupid, but it wasn't preachy, just unsubtle. But it was also entertaining because it was so unsubtle and incompetent. But anyways, let's read these supposed moral dilemmas that we would supposedly think about. Doria believes in always treating everyone with kindness and respect. How can you show respect and kindness to everyone you meet? Everyone? Well, we don't really see her display this kindness towards Laird or her own step-parents. Not that she should have to, but still, I don't know, it's hard to figure out people these days. Against all odds, Sebastian works hard to discover the secret of the pea. When things seem uncertain, why should you persevere? Sebastian didn't start working hard until he suddenly found the lost information on the scroll off screen, and the test detects good princesses, not princesses in general, which means that in this world it's going to have really narrow findings, and that still doesn't explain how good princesses can detect something that would get squished between heavy mattresses and make no difference with pressure, mass, and open space in a mattress combined. I guess good princesses princesses are pure of heart and can read your mind like Goku can? And now the last two questions. Laird is cruel and will stop at nothing to get what he wants. How can you meet your needs without hurting others? Hildegard is spoiled, selfish, and thoughtless towards others. When should you be generous and put others' needs before your own? Laird's definitely an evil's guy, but he won't stop at nothing. He does seem to care about his wife and his daughter. Hildegard also gets compared to her dead mother a lot, but she does seem spoiled. The sad thing is, Mark Swan, the director, said in an interview that TV Tropes linked to that much of the Disney-like nature of the movie was by accident, and that they actually thought of some of the stuff that was also in Hercules and the non-Disney but Disney-like Anastasia on their own before they sold Disney and Don Bluth respectively to it, but they couldn't go back and change it because of the budget, and part of the problem was corporate interference. Apparently, Mark Swan also wanted Daria to be a more assertive and complex character, but feature films for families didn't like that. On the other hand, this is probably why this film's terrible quality is entertaining rather than unwatchable. See, most entertainingly bad films, like The Room and Troll 2, end up that way by complete accident, and when people try to intentionally make bad movies, like Seltzer and Friedberg do, it almost never ends up funny. As they say, bad comedy is worse than bad drama. 
This movie's director, however, was sort of in between. He wasn't trying to make a bad movie at all, that can be blamed on studio executive meddling, but he knew this movie more or less was gonna suck. As a result of this, combined with the actors clearly enjoying themselves, make this film pretty entertaining, but riffable. And seriously, the villain looks like Voltaire, I still can't get over that! Still, if they wanted to justify this good things to talk about, they could have had Doria go through character development where she learned to be more merciful and selfless, especially since being raised with horrible parents wouldn't normally make someone super nice. They could have had Doria only liking animals and hating humans, but like in Once Upon a Forest, she could have learned that not all humans are bad, like with Rollo and Heath. There's also apparently a spin-off TV series that exists, but doesn't on the internet. Damn, I always hate it when something on YouTube I like permanently disappears. So there, this ship has been sunk to the bottom of the sea, but I hope you guys find it too, because I truly recommend it. Especially if you're both a fan of Disney or Don Bluth films and Voltaire the Singer. Because, er, really, I can't get over the fact that the villain looks almost exactly like Voltaire. Anyways, this is Captain Spifari signing out. I'm the fly in your suit, I'm the pedal in your shoe, I'm the thief beneath your bed. Devil tips his hat to